Jeff James is with us again this morning, and uh, on a topic that uh, when I first looked up here, I thought it was my business plan. <laughs> and that would underline scarcity. <laughs> so Jeff needs no introduction. He's a great friend of this uh, of this Sunday school class, and so Jeff, we welcome you and look forward to your great words this morning. Thank you very much, and. I'm I'm loud, but I'm I'm told that we'll 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 get. I'll try to be quieter for a second <laughs> until they get it. Uh, I was starting to pass out uh, earlier. I mean, pass out brochures earlier, <laughs> but I know I didn't get everybody in line. So my good friend Wayne Kendrick is is deputized. If you did not get a brochure yet, please raise your hand. I think this side of the room, especially Wayne. Uh, uh, so this is almost, not quite hot off the press, but, but we, this is our annual report that we did in, at the end of December uh, for the end of the, the previous fiscal year that talks about what happened at Restore Hope in 22-23. And I can give you the short version of it if you want. Uh, everything that you would expect to be up was up. Um, and everything that you would expect to be down is down. It was, that's a pretty good thing. The, uh, the, we were able to help more people than, than ever before. So we saw gains, we saw increases in our food program, our rent assistance program. Uh, we saw 100, 200 more kids come for school supplies. 500 more people received Thanksgiving baskets last year. Uh, so everything that you would imagine was up was up. Um, the good news is we were also able, for the most part, to keep expenses down. And so that's, the, that's a good thing, right? We want to make sure we're, we're going forward. We're in a really strong position, but I'll tell you that as we look forward, the, the business plan that we have feels a little bit, as you were saying, Ken, uh, I'm feeling, I, I, I will admit to you that I'm feeling some scarcity today. We, we've distributed five, almost five and a half million dollars in rent assistance since April of last year, which is, which is amazing. Um, it's not quite where we were in the height of the pandemic. So for those of you who, I, I, sh I probably should have said this going forward, for those of you who weren't here the previous time I spoke, Restore Hope is a, an agency in our community that works to fight poverty. Um, we're historically United Methodist, I'm a United Methodist pastor. And I know given all of the things, I'm still a United Methodist pastor. <laughs> um, but I regularly speak beyond our denomination. <laughs> um, and we have a location at Asbury. We, we're we're, we're, we're multi-denominational in our approach. Uh, we're about the kingdom of God. That's it. Um, uh, but we, we have helped people with food. That's what we've done for almost 46 years now. We've had a rent assistance program, really the only major rent assistance program in the state I now know. Um, for almost 30 years at this point. We help with school supplies, Thanksgiving, and, and generally fight poverty. And I love my job. There have been several high-profile jobs open in the nonprofit world lately, one that only deals with food, one that only deals with housing, some that only deal with church work. The great thing about my job is that I get to help with food, I get to help with housing, I get to be in, involved in the church too. So it's kind of a unicorn job for me. So I don't, don't plan on going anywhere anytime soon. At least that's my business plan. <laughs> so during the pandemic, we helped with $58 million of rent assistance from, from, March, or from May of 2020 to November of 22. And so even $5.5 million is still a step down from, from where we were at the height. It doesn't feel like a step down, uh, but, but it's a step down. But the, the, the thing that's on the horizon for me that makes me feel a little bit of scarcity is that the big federal dollars that we're currently spending are going away. We just this month allocated our la the last penny of $13 million of county funds that we've spent since March of 21. So we no longer have funds from Tulsa County. Well, it's federal funds through Tulsa County. We have about five million, about four and a half million dollars left of city funds from those big, that big pool. And that's a big number, right? Four and a half million dollars is a big number. But when you're averaging spending $150,000 a week, that goes pretty quickly. 
And so then the question is, what's next? And the good news is we're thinking about what's next. We're trying to imagine what that next world looks like. But it has me also feeling a little bit of scarcity. And I would imagine, just to kind of turn this away from Restore Hope and onto something that's a little bit more personal for all of us, I would imagine that you feel scarcity on a regular basis. You may not call it scarcity, and it may not be your, the, your, your business plan or your bank balance or any of those things, but I would imagine that you feel scarcity in, in some way or another. This is the, 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 old, the old trope, right? All right, raise your hand, glass half full. Okay, half empty. Yeah, I vary from day to day. <laughs> it may it actually usually uh, I, I I've given this talk a, a few times at ORU. There's a professor there that uh, that invites me to come speak to one of their theology classes, and I'm I, it's usually my my cup of coffee that I have, and depending on if it's half full or empty depends on a little bit how much energy I have in the day. But we make this about pessimism and optimism more often than not, right? We say, oh, if, if you're a glass half full person, you must be an optimist. If you're a glass half empty person, you must be a pessimist. And I think it's something deeper than that, really. I think uh, it's, it's, is there still half left? Right, that's an abundance mentality. There's still half a glass left. Or, oh my gosh, I only have half a glass of water left. Do you sit, do you feel that difference? So often in our world, we think, oh, there's not enough. There's not enough resources to do what we need to do. There's, there's not enough time in the day to, to get all the things done. I don't have enough ability to do that thing. And it's pervasive. And honestly, it's something that we see almost every day at Restore Hope. You can imagine that the families who come to Restore Hope come to us feeling scarcity, right? Their, their food pantry is, is running empty, and so they need to come to us for food. Their bank accounts are lower because they lost a job or they, they had to use that, that savings account to, to put new tires on the car so they could keep going to work, and they no longer have the money to pay for their rent. The families that come to us for, for help come to us feeling scarcity. We have a Thanksgiving program that I mentioned. We have a school supply program, especially with our Thanksgiving program, which is a really interesting thing for that program specifically. We used to see lines of people. This is a fuzzy picture. It's not really from the 1980s or anything. It's just... Uh, it, it, it's old phone technology. It's amazing what phones can do. If I, if I was to take this picture now, it would be HD. Thankfully, we don't have these lines anymore, and I'll tell you why here in a bit, but that's a line for uh, people waiting to get their Thanksgiving baskets. You can see, I'm going to use this laser pointer here. These are some, some scouts, some Boy Scouts, carrying turkeys and groceries out to take that to, to somebody's car. So these are people waiting for their Thanksgiving basket. Now the thing about them waiting for their Thanksgiving basket is every single one of them had a piece of paper in their hand guaranteeing that they were going to get a basket. And yet, they lined up before dawn that day. Why? Scarcity. They thought they weren't going to get one, right? Because there are other places in Tulsa where you line up for your Thanksgiving basket and the first 200, I don't know how many the number is, people get a basket. And if you're 201, you're out of luck, right? First come, first served. Can somebody, this is a really smart room, can somebody tell me where that is in the Bible? Right, everybody does it. We don't, but every like nonprofits around the country, probably around the world, do first come, first served. The reason 
nonprofits do, first come, first served, is there are limited resources. Scarcity, right? It's not just the clients that are feeling scarcity. It's the agencies that are doing that too. It's the agencies that are saying, well, we only have enough turkeys for this number of people. We don't do anything first come, first serve, because the Bible says the first shall be last. So what's interesting is after this picture was taken, th this line was really a wake-up call for me. I knew this in my heart that we shouldn't do this, but this line was really a wake-up call for me. So we, s we started doing something different. For one thing, this was at a time when we, we said, okay, we've got 600 vouchers out there. We're going to have a window between 9 and noon. Come and get your vouchers. Well, everybody wanted to come early because they thought they were going to run out. So after this, we, we, we split into three groups, 200, 200, 200. And we said, okay, we're going to balance those groups. Then we said, wait a second. It never says the first shall be first in the Bible. So we started doing something a little tricky. The first 200 people that signed up for a Thanksgiving basket were put in the last group. And the last 200 people were put in the first group. And what we saw was kind of amazing. The, the group that came first, the people who were last, they didn't get there all that early. They had already experienced abundance in a little way. But that last group, the people who came on the very first day of registration, the people who were already out in the cold the, the, the day they registered, they got there way too early. And there was a big line. I will say since this, since that, even then that time, we iterate, we're continuously improving. And so this last year, we didn't even fill our parking lot with people coming in and we distributed more Thanksgiving baskets than we had the year before. Because we had 30 groups of 30. I don't know if that's the exact number, but it's instead of big groups, we shrunk the groups, we shrunk the time, so it was a 15 minute window. But the people would come in, get their basket, go out, get their basket, go out. And the best thing is, we had a, a client come to me, they, they, I was in the parking lot directing traffic, and a client came to me and said, I just want you to know, I see when, I had to get a Thanksgiving basket last year, this is even better than last year. Last year was good, this, this year was even better than last year. That does my heart good. <laughs> but this, uh, this idea of first come, first served is pervasive, and it's not just in the nonprofit world. The idea of scarcity is part of the reason why churches aren't planting churches. When this church was started, I, I, I'm familiar with the United Methodist churches around the area. So New Haven is not far from here, right? About half a mile. And Southern Hills, where I pastored for five years, is, is just south on Lewis. They were started by the same gentleman, Joe MacArthur. He was a layperson, two years apart. At that time... We were planting churches. Now, we outkicked our coverage a little bit now, as it turns out, but we were planting a lot of churches in that time. We're not doing that anymore. Almost, almost no denomination is really out there planting churches on a regular basis anymore. Now, part of it is the larger demographics and all of that, but part of it is it's really hard for a pastor and, a, and, a, and the church to say, okay, we're going to send out 20 of our best people who give regularly, who are there every Sunday, we're going to send out 20 of those people to start something new that might not work. That's hard, right? Because then you start feeling scarcity. Well, I kind of miss Joe. Well, Jane was always the person who did that, right? All of a sudden, you're feeling, oh, well, we don't have enough people anymore. The reality is that God has called us to multiplication, that God has called us to abundance, that God has called us to, to spread the gospel. But in our hearts, we feel like we can't let those things go because well, what will happen if we let them go? And I don't think it's even just within the church that we feel scarcity. 
Again, how often have you heard somebody say, well, I just don't have enough time, money, skills. Oh, I, I can't do that. I'm, I am not a handy person. I, 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 at some point, I hope to retire, and I would love to join Wayne and the, the Tuesday Morning Miracle Worker. I don't know that they actually want me on the job. <laughs> but you know what I found? YouTube is a pretty powerful teacher. And I've changed toilet parts and done all of those kinds, you know, because I watched a video. I, this was my shining moment this last year. The, the motor, the fan on my blower broke, and I bought a part, replaced, took the whole thing apart and replaced it, and it works great now. <laughs> YouTube, right? I said to myself, well, I don't have enough mechanical skill. I'm not, I can't do that. The reality is, I had enough, I just wasn't allowing myself to engage in the work. So the question for us today is going to be a theological question. Because I don't think the question is, do you have enough time, money, resources, gifts, skills, any of that? I think it's, it's do you recognize the gifts, skills, money, time that you have? So we're going to ask the question, what does God say about scarcity and abundance? And I believe that by the time we're done today, you'll recognize along with me that scarcity is a lie. And that, the, that abundance is the truth of our world. We just have to see it. So we're going to dive in deep to scripture today. I see several of you have Bibles. That's really good. Because we're, now's your time to volunteer. Okay? We're, gonna, we're going cover to cover today. So I'm not a proof texting guy, right? I'm not going to pick different passages out of scripture and say, this is what the Bible says because this one scripture says it. We're going to go all the way from Genesis to, it's not quite Revelation, but it's close. First Timothy is knocking on the door. Uh, who wants to read Genesis 1, 11 through 12? It'll go a lot faster if you say yes fast. It's short. It's two, pa two, two verses. You got it. Mark's got it. How about, how about Genesis 1, 20 to 22? If you've got a Bible app on your phone, that'll work. Ken's got it. Ken's got it. Oh, there you go. I like it. I like it. And, and if there may be some of you who, if we, if we don't have enough Bibles to go around, there may be some of you who need to read twice. And that's okay. It's good to read the Bible at church. Uh, Exodus 16, 4. Just one little verse. Bueller. Okay, so when we get to the New Testament, Kenan is in. Yeah. Exodus 16, 4. And, and I can, I, I've, got, I've got these stories not quite memorized, the actual text. So if we, if we can't actually read them, I can tell you what they're about. Psalm 50, 10 through 12. Thank you for the quick response there. 1 Kings 17, 10 through 16. I know it feels long, but it might be my favorite one on there. You got it? All right. Uh, Jeremiah, okay, now, I've, now I'm playing favorites because I still love this Jeremiah passage. 29, 5 through 7, you got it? Uh, Haggai 2, 6 through 9. You can find it in the index. Haggai 2, 6 through 9. Malachi 3, 9 and 10. Who's, the, who's on the finance committee at the church? <coughs> Raise your hand if you're on the finance committee. Hank is. All right, Hank, do you have your Bible app? No? Okay. <laughs> this is going to be your favorite passage, though. Malachi 3, 9 through 10. You got it, Hank. You're the right person for the job. All right, Keenan, now you're on. Matthew 6, 25 through 33. You got it. Mark 6, 35 to 44. You've got it, Kim. Thank you. John 2, 9 through 10. Thank you. John 4, 11 to 14. You're never going to invite me back because I'm putting you to work. Okay, we'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. Uh, John 10.10, 10, everybody's saying, oh, that's just one verse. I'll take that one. John 10.10, 10. come back to it, okay. 
Luke 8, 40 to 56. I'll, I'll summarize that one. I'll take that, off. I'll take that one for the team. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 13 to 15. Back here. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. Back there. And then 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19. Last one. We may not get to it, so you, you, might, be, you might luck out. We may run out of time. You got that one, Ken? Okay. Okay, Genesis 1, 11 through 12. Yeah, let me get that mic for you. I'll be Oprah today. Then God said, God, lo God lost his place. <laughs> that happens from time to time. It does. Yeah, there's a lot of pages there. 11 through 12. Okay. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. So, yeah, so I just want you to think, that sounds like abundance, doesn't it? Seed, fruit plants life growth and god said that it was good right from the very beginning god is pl literally planting abundance creating creating food for the world to eat genesis 1 20 to 22 and god said let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky so god created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind, and God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And that's it. <laughs> when, when you think swarm, do you think a few or a lot? <laughs> right? I think other, ver other translations of that say teeming, right? The, the world was teeming with life swarms be fruitful multiply from the very beginning the story of god in the world is abundance creation we were created in a world that was created for abundance every living thing i mean we think about the ark and i know that there's a place that you can go visit that that patterns it out but i don't think we can imagine the abundance of the world even that was on the ark, and that's nothing compared to what the rest of the world is. I mean, think about the Amazon rainforest and all of the, the life that's in just that place. It's incredible. And that's just a taste of, of the abundance in the world. Ex Exodus 16, 4. Oh, sorry. Mike. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. The people were feeling scarcity, right? Remember the story, the people of God are, are leaving Egypt. They're going back to the, they're going to the promised land. And they say, what, what, we're hungry. Why, don't, why didn't you just leave us to die in Egypt? And God rains food. When the people are feeling scarcity, God says, here you go. And even when the manna wasn't enough, God provided quail. Right? Water from the rock. When, 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 those, when God's people who were doing the things that God told them to do, leave Egypt, God provided. When they were feeling scarcity, when they were doing what God called them to do, God provided enough. Now, could you go out and, and gather lots and lots of manna and then save it for the next day? No, right? But there was enough for that day. Psalm 50, 10 through 12. For every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the fields are mine. 
If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. I love it. God, God sounds a little bit like uh, a young boy or, or a girl at that time. It's mine. But he's saying everything is mine, right? Actually, when I, when I changed our Thanksgiving policy, I wrote a blog post, uh, and I called it the turkeys on a thousand hills. <laughs> and when I tell the people who come, in, they're in that last group, when I tell them that they were first, and I tell them, well, God says the first shall be last, the last shall be first, and that here at Restore Hope, we believe God owns the turkeys on a thousand hills. They laugh like you did. Instead of giving me the death stare, which is what they, what they start off with when I tell them they were first and now they're last, <laughs> they laugh. Because it's, it's, it's really, it's laughable to think about how much is God's, right? It's God's. The turkeys, the, the cattle, the every living thing. It's God's. God's got everything. All right, who's next? Back there. Oh, who's next? There we go. 1 Kings 17. So now we're in the prophets. We've, we're moving from the law to the prophets. Uh, so the Torah is the first five books. The, the prophets are the ones who were speaking for God. And we're talking about the prophet Elijah now. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. She called to her. Uh, he called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I, I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son for this is what the Lord the God of Israel says the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land uh, she went away and did as Elijah had told her so there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family for the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. <laughs> Again, this is one of my favorite passages. Um, so we kn what do we know about widows at that time? Not a whole lot of protection for them, right? It mentions widows and orphans a lot in the Bible because they were kind of the, the lowest class. They're, you know, it was a very patriarchal society, especially then. And if you were a widow, you didn't have that regular caregiver to take care of you. you all of those things. And so this widow is about to make her last meal for her and her son. They're going to eat their last meal and, and then die. And there's a, there's a great Yiddish word that I think speaks to what Elijah does here, chutzpah. <laughs> Elijah has the chutzpah to, <laughs> to ask this woman, I know this is the last meal you're planning on ever eating, but first... Make me a cake. Can you imagine? I mean, seriously. This woman's about to make her last meal, and you're going to take it to feed yourself? Man who can take care of himself in the world? And she does it? Isn't that incredible? That woman of faith that I love, of course, of course she does. That's, that's, that's what women do so often anyway. They're great people of faith. They step out in faith, and they're great caregivers of others. Of course she, she said yes to the prophet. And, but it, it says a key word in there. She was afraid, right? Did you hear that? Afraid? Do you think fear goes with scarcity or abundance? Scarcity, right? Fear goes with scarcity. And... and and, and Elijah says, don't be afraid. And what happens? The jar of oil, the jar of flour, never run out. And ultimately, the, the story gets better. The, the, kid, the kid dies. Elijah brings him back to life. It's, you know, it's, it's really incredible stuff that, that when we participate with God, the woman participated with God, 
and there was abundance. By the way, it's no small thing that Jesus mentions the widow of Zarephath when he's talking about people of faith. That story, Jesus quotes that story. So it's not really that bad if I think it's one of my favorites. I think it may have been one of Jesus' favorites, too. It's a pretty great story. All right, Jeremiah going into another favorite of mine. Now we're moving from, the, the, from Israel into a different time. So uh, the exile. You know, the Babylonians came in, wiped out the, the Hebrew people, took their best and brightest away, many of them away to Babylon. And so those people who were in Babylon really wanted to, to go back. They were feeling lost, alone, abandoned. They were far away from home. They were seriously homesick. They were persecuted by the Babylonians. They had nothing. Imagine, I mean, it's not hard to imagine given the politics of today's world, but imagine you are a stranger in a strange land and you're oppressed by the people who are are all around you, and you're far away from home, you're far away from your faith, you're far away from the, the temple that had been destroyed. Imagine that, that feels like scarcity, doesn't it? And this is what God says into that scarcity. Build houses and settle down and plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of this city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. I mean, build houses. Plant vineyards. Vineyards take a long time. Right? you got to you got to put, put the rows in. you got to cultivate the grapes, all of that. The, God's not saying this is a short-term deal. God's not saying, oh, I'll get you back. It's a three-hour tour. We'll get you back real soon. <laughs> He's talking about years, years in this place where they're being persecuted. And even more than that, it says, seek the welfare of the place where I have sent you, because in their welfare you'll find yours. It's not just that God is providing for them, which God does. It's God is saying, take care of those around you too. Take care of your enemies, for in their welfare you'll find yours. Whew. That's tough. That's tough. By the way, right, Jeremiah 29, 11 comes almost right after that, right? I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you. And not to harm you. Yeah, a future with hope. It's going to be a while, though, it says right after that. All right, Haggai 2, 6 through 9. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill their pots with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. The sil I'm going to shake and it's all going to come out. The silver is mine. The gold is mine. Now, it's one thing, I think, for us to say, okay, God's got the cattle and the turkeys and all of that. That's all God's. But the silver and the gold, I kind of want to put that in my pocket. Right? Right? My, my realtor, when we bought our house, our, our realtor, who's an amazing woman, I, I, love, I love her. Her husband is a pastor and actually officiated our wedding. Um, and she said, now the great thing about buying this house is that in the books down at the courthouse, it says this is yours. The title's got my name on it. And I love this woman, but I, and, I, and so I didn't say it to her, to her face. She was dead wrong <laughs> now it's true that according to the county government that house is mine actually it's a trust but that's a different story altogether but whose house is it it's god's house when it, sh when, it when push comes to shove when god shakes things 
it's all God's, right? Everything we have is God's. Now that's scary, and it gets even scarier when we're going to come back to the finance committee. <laughs> Actually, it's kind of a nice deal that we get when we come back to the finance committee. You'll hear it. Everything is God's. I mean, you might have a, a, a list of your net worth, and you have this account and that account. I've got one. But really, I should just change all the names. It's God's, 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 God's. It's God's pension plan. It's God's health savings account. It's God's savings account. It's God's house. It's all God's. The question is, what are we going to do with God's stuff that God's given to us? Because really, and we've all, you've all experienced it in some way or another, when push comes to shove, when God starts shaking, God's going to shake some things loose and show that the silver is mine and the gold is mine. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. <laughs> Told you. Finance committee's, fi finance committee's favorite verse. What's a tithe? Ten percent. Wait, you're telling me, you're telling me that God owns all of it and only asks for 10% back? Yeah, it is the gross. It's not the net. That's a, that's a good point, Kim. Thank you. Oh, it will. So, think about that. That is the greatest deal ever. Can you imagine somebody who owns everything and says, here it is, you just got a 10%. You can have it 90% of the time, just I want it 10% of the time. So I, I, this, this may make several of you mad at me, but I went to Duke uh, from, for seminary. And to get into Duke basketball games is really hard, right? Sold out since 1990. Uh, 9,314 seats in that stadium. They don't, they're not building it any bigger. And when we had tickets, we would get a card, uh, a ticket card, and we shared it as a group. And of course, everybody wants to go to the good games, right? The Carolina game and that sort of thing. But imagine if God was the ticket holder and, and there are 10 games and God says, I just want to go to the South Carolina upstate. You take the Carolina game and, and all of the, you know, all of these other games that come in. I just want, I just want the, that, that early preseason game, Right? Imagine, I don't know, some of you may be OU, OSU football holders, right? Imagine being that season ticket holder and say, nah, I don't need Bedlam or Texas. I don't know. I, I'm a basketball and baseball guy, so I'm, I shouldn't go too far into the realm of football. That's an, that's an incredible deal. Now, it sounds like it's hard, right? And it is hard, but it's an incredible deal. And you know what we could do if we tithed? There's actually uh, a, an article that was written, and I'll send it to Ken and if we can send it out to the class. Uh, the, the National Christian Foundation, I think, has picked up now. It was in a magazine called Relevant Magazine, and it said, what would happen if the church tithed? Now, the average United Methodist, we're supposed to give 10%. The average United Methodist gives 2 Unfortunately, that's true for most denominations, Probably a lot of them are given off the net, not the gross. But most denominations don't even come close to 10. The Mormons are the only group that get above 10, but they're asked for 20. Right? If the Christian church tithed, if we tested God in that, 10%, we could end global hunger, we could end... We could educate every single person in the United States all the way through college. We could eradicate major diseases. We could fund missions around the world and still have billions of dollars left over. If we did what, if we took that deal, if we tested God with 10%. Matthew 6, 25 through 33. That's Keenan, You're not going to believe that the New Testament modern version doesn't identify the virgins. So I'm going to guess that it's uh, like look at the birds in the sky. Yep. Or yeah, don't worry. Don't worry. Yeah, okay. there you go, there right you there. Go. 
Don't worry about a living, wondering what you are going to eat or drink or what you're going to wear. Surely life is more important than food and the body more important than the clothes you wear. Look at the birds in the sky. They never sow nor reap nor store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you much more valuable to him than they are? Can any of you, however much he worries, make himself an inch taller? And why do you worry about clothes? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They neither work nor weave. But I tell you that not even Solomon in all his glory was ever arrayed, arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes, clothes the flowers of the field, which are alive today and burned in the stove tomorrow, is he not much more likely to clothe you, you of little faith? So don't worry about, and don't worry and don't keep saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? That is what pagans are always looking for. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Set your heart on his kingdom and his goodness, and all these things will come to you as a matter of course. Yeah. Don't, don't worry about tomorrow, for each day has enough trouble of its own. I'll tell you, I think I mentioned at the, the last time I was here, when we were in the thick of that rent, rent situation, I was dealing with some anxiety. Anxiety, worry, it's all connected to scarcity. At that time, I was worried that we didn't have enough staff to be able to do what we were trying to do. I was also worried, despite the fact that there were millions of dollars that there would not be enough to help all of the people who were coming and asking for help. I'll tell you, every single time that I've been worried about whether or not there would be enough, if we're doing the things that God has called us to do, every single time there has been enough. Every time. If we have time today, I'll go through some of the stories of of. of of abundance that, that we have at Restore Hope. That's incredible stuff. But that worry, it's pervasive and it's real. And uh, you know what I started to do when I would get worried? <laughs> I would go out of my office. I was, at, I was the only one working in our main campus at that time. I would go out of my office, walk out the door. It was good to get some, some sunshine and vitamin D anyway. And I would look at the power lines because almost always on those power lines there were some birds. I literally went out and looked at the birds and said, God, you're taking care of them. Please take care of me too. And God did. I was worried, but there was enough. God takes care of the sparrows. God takes care of the lilies. And if God's going to do that for them, God's going to do that for us. If we do what God's called us to do, there's going to be enough. Mark 6, 35 through 44. May I suggest that you, you don't have too much, you have a few minutes, why don't you just keep talking? Okay. Give us life. I'll, I'll, life example. I'll, I'll, go th I'll go through these quickly. I'll just, I'll, no, that's okay. You want me to? No, that's okay. I'll go, I'll summarize. I think you're right, Kim. I think, I think there is an abundance of time, but there is also an abundance of scripture passages there. Um, Mark 6, 35 through 44. Jesus, G there are a lot of stories where Jesus goes and feeds people, right? There are 5,000 men, and, and probably double that when you talk about the women and children, opens, you know, God, Jesus is there and says, okay, disciples, feed them. Can you imagine the look on the disciples' face when Jesus says, feed them? With what? We gave up our fishing jobs for you, buddy. Like, if we were still fishermen, we could probably feed them, but we're not. We're with you. And he, uh, he says, oh, there's a kid over there with some lunch. By the way, almost all of those feeding stories, there are several feeding stories in the Bible, almost all of them, I want you to count the items that Jesus uses. In this particular story, it's five loaves and two fish. What does that equal? Twelve. Come on, people. You're working on some of that old math. Of course, five plus two is seven. Seven is what? Seven is the number of days in creation. It's God's number, right? Seven is that, that holy number. Seven is that number of, of God, okay? And there were 12 baskets left over. So Jesus feeds probably 12,000, 15,000 people with seven things. 
and there are 12 things left over. What's 12? 12 tribes of Israel, 12 disciples. 12 is the number of completeness, of wholeness, right? With God, seven, there's enough. 12. Those, those stories are not just telling you, like, okay, Jesus fed a lot of people. They're putting a story of abundance mixed into it. That, that that audience would have absolutely known. They would have known what 7 and 12 meant. Um, Jesus' math is with God, there is enough. 5 plus 2 equals 12. With God, there is enough. Right? So the disciples from then on should have said, okay, God, I'll do it. They kept messing up, just like we do. John 2, 9 through 10, Jesus goes to a wedding. I'm not sure he really wanted to go. I'm not sure how many weddings we all want to go to. But his mom was there, and his mom was a little bit particular about Jesus taking care of the other people, and he actually curses her, which I'm not sure he should do to his mother, let alone the mother of God. Um, but, but then ultimately he does what he is supposed to do, which is he turns the water into wine. My, my youngest son uh, went to Eisenhower, he's still there, he's, he's about to finish, um, and they do a, an exchange trip to France. And so... Uh, he went at the end of the year last year to, to France for three weeks, which is crazy for a 10-year-old to be on a plane. <sighs> crazy for mom and dad, too. But he went to the Louvre, and, and there he saw the Mona Lisa. Famous painting. It's fine. Doesn't even have eyebrows. Turn around from the Mona Lisa and face the other way, and you have this giant painting the size of the wall of the wedding at Cana. And everybody in that painting, except for one, is falling over drunk. Jesus is the one sitting in the middle, beatific. Jesus turned 180 gallons of water into 180 gallons of really good wine. Not even like the $100 a bottle stuff. More better than that. Right? Really good wine. 180 gallons of it. With God, when Jesus enters the, the chat, when Jesus enters the conversation... There's enough. There's enough. John 4, 11 through 14 is the woman at the well. The woman at the well has nothing. She's, she's, a, she's, a, she's a Samaritan. She's maybe not the most holy person in the world. She's there at noon because the other women wouldn't have anything to do with her. She's getting well water from the well. Jesus says, if you were to seek the living water, you will never run out. Right? This well will run dry at some point. The living water will not. Right? Jesus is the living water. Jesus is that source of water from the well. John 10.10, 10, I have come that you may have life and have it in scarcity. No, that's not it. I have come that you have life and have it abundantly. Right? Okay. Luke 8, 40 to 56, Jesus is uh, on his way to a really important appointment. Right? He's going to speak to the challengers class, and it's a really kind of a big deal. There are important people in that class. Cool. Okay, it's Jairus, the head of the synagogue, but same deal. And a woman comes up to him and touches him. And Jesus feels the power come from him, which is kind of an amazing thing. And this woman is then ridiculed by the disciples. We don't have time for you leave him alone he's got to get to the challengers the Jairus's house Jesus takes time to heal the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years Jesus had enough power even though some of it somehow went away had enough power to heal the woman and had enough time to get to Jairus's house except Jairus' daughter had died. But Jesus, with God, there's enough. And Jesus shows power by raising that person to life, too. Right? Just like Elijah did with the kid, by the way. There's these connections. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip uh, 2 Corinthians uh, and go to 1 Timothy. Because sometimes we feel like with, with abundance, we, that, that God wants us to... There's the, you know, the great old song, oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz, right? Now, I'm not, I don't, I, I, I actually think it's okay 
if God has, if God lets you drive his Mercedes Benz, which by the way, it's God's, right? It's God's Lexus, God's Tesla, it's God's everything, right? It's all God's. If God lets you drive it, that's fine. Abundance doesn't mean just compiling all the stuff, right? That's not what abundance means. Abundance is not Scrooge McDuck diving into his pit of gold coins. That's not to say that, that you can't have wealth and you, and, you, and you should give up everything. To No, I think it's just, it's, it's what do you do with the, the stuff that God has given you? God's not calling us to be overly rich. God's not calling us to be overly poor, I don't think. Although I do think God calls some people to do that. But from the very beginning of the church, the church has relied on people who are rich and poor. Lydia was a, a maker of cloth, um, an a extremely wealthy woman in, the, in, in Philippi, and funded Paul's mission. By the way, also probably helped the people who were poor in Jerusalem because Paul was taking up a collection, right? It was the early women of the church who funded most of the, the early part of what was happening. There were rich people and poor people in the early church. The question is, what do we do with it? What do we do with our abundance? Because abundance is the truth. Scarcity is the lie. What do we do with the abundance that we've been given? And what those passages from 2 Corinthians and 1 Timothy tell us is to, to, to be good stewards of them. Be good stewards of what we have. So I'll tell one story about Restore Hope and then I'll be done. So um, early on when we were just starting, when I was just starting at Restore Hope, uh, because my, my youngest son, who was about to finish fifth grade there, was, a, was in a stroller. Um, we had a school supply drive, and we, we, we give out kits to every age. And our six, six through eight baskets require a binder. And we ran out of binders uh, that we wanted to put in these boxes. And so my staff said, okay, we're going to have to shut down all of the registration. No more school supplies for anybody because we can't give the sixth through eighth graders their binders. And I said, no, that's not going to happen. And I took the lunch break and went out and bought as many binders I could from school supply stores and Target and everything. I spent $300 more than budget. I went over budget to go out and do that big thing. In the end, we had one six through eight box left, but we were able to help everybody who came to, to get school supplies. The next day, that was a Thursday, the next day on a Friday, I went to a, a TTCU location where we were doing a radio remote for the, the Christian radio station at the time. And I got there and they said, oh, you just missed it. I said, what? I said, a, a guy just came and, and he made a donation. And I said, oh, that's really fantastic. Do you happen to know what the donation was? <laughs> it was $300. The next year it was markers. The next year it's something else. This year... We had hundreds of boxes ready to go, prepared for our school supply drive. When we locked our door on the last day of registration, we had five. There was enough for every single person who came. We were worried, we were scrambling. I bought several Walmarts out of composition books. That's a fun thing to do. But there was enough. So what I want to tell you is two things. If you are worried about anything, worry and fear, that is scarcity. And scarcity leads us to turn inward, which ultimately, Luther and Augustine said, curvata sensei is the heart of sin, being curved in on ourselves. That's the opposite of what God has called us to do. What God has called us to do is be the people of the open hand. That's Bono. That's a quote from Bono from U2. But it says, we are the people of the open hand. But that's Jesus, right? Jesus is the, the person of the open hand. This is the quintessential image we have of Jesus, giving up everything he has for us. So the next time the finance committee sends out their <laughs> mailers, the next time somebody asks you to Read scripture in church. <laughs> the next time somebody asks you to be on that committee or do that thing, 
or to fix the toilet that you don't know how to do. Or if it's God's will, if it's what God wants you to do, or they ask you to come back again, <laughs> if it's God's will, there'll be enough time. There'll be enough skill. There'll be enough resources. If it's God's will, it's going to happen. That's my prayer for you and for me as I worry about my own scarcity going forward. If it's God's will, that'll happen too. Will you join me in prayer? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for abundance. Thank you for your gift to us of hope. Thank you for the scriptures, cover to cover, that help us to know who you are. God, I ask that you bless the Challengers class with life. Bless, restore hope with life and hope. And help us to help the world see your abundance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.